everybody well rested. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so let's kind of escape the drama and focus on some differential equations. Um, and so the plan for today is to continue working with Laplace transforms. And again, I just want to be clear that um, this material, chapter six, Laplace transforms will be on the very last exam. So that's gonna be the only content on the last exam. Um, the exam next week will be on systems of differential equations. Um, so in light of that exam coming up, um, I just wanna let you know that I put up some uh, exam review materials over here. Um, it's a little bit different than the previous one in that most of the problems I just picked out of the book. Um, so you can refer to the notes um, for those. And I picked ones that had solutions in the back of the book. So you can check your work on those. Um, so if you wanna get started on that over the weekends, um, that's a good plan. On Monday, we'll review for the exam. Um, and then we've got the exam next Wednesday. So if you, the exam you should expect will be pretty similar in format to the last one. Um, I think I will make it a little bit shorter um, this time since, um, yeah. So, but otherwise it'll have the multiple choice followed by the, um, you know, show your work part of the exam. But we can talk more about that on Monday. And just the, the last announcement is I just want to remind you um, tonight, we've got this math advising event um, from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, that's on Zoom, and that announcement is um, in Canvas. But if you have any questions about that, um, let me know. Um, okay, so um, I guess while we're here, let me open up the, the quiz that you guys had for today um, and see if there are any questions um, about this. So are, were there any questions? Um, okay, so we need to make that S positive so that the negative NS is negative. Yeah, so the, the main point here is that when you're dealing with an exponential function, um, it will as, and you're taking the limit of it as its power goes to infinity, then as long as the power of the exponent is negative, that would converge. If it's positive, then it wouldn't converge. Yes. Um, let me write that up on an iPad in a sec. When we're proving these for ourselves, like on the tests and stuff, um, do we need to do L'Hopital's rule? If we have time, I mean, we probably should, but could we, is it sufficient to say, e to negative infinity is zero? Has um, zero? Like you, you wouldn't need L'Hopital's rule to prove that. Okay. So L'Hopital's rule you would need if you had like an infinity times a zero or something like that. But um, let me write this out. So if you're just calculating the, the limit, of this, um, just keep in mind that in general, if we have e to the negative t, the graph would look like this. If we have e to the positive t, the graph looks like this. <clears throat> so as long as the power is negative, as the it goes to infinity, it's gonna converge to zero. So um, yeah, if you want to justify this, um, you can say it's going to equal zero as long as in this case, um, S is bigger than zero. Uh, and so then there was one, a second one, which looked at um, the limit. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, Was it like, I think it was like something like this um, essentially. And so it's just the same idea here and that in the end, what we wanna make sure that um, the power 
is negative or else it wouldn't converge. Um, so we know that that part is positive. So if I want this product to um, be negative, then I would want this to also be positive, right? Because I would want negative times positive times positive. Um, so in this case, you would want to check. You just want to make sure that S minus two is bigger than zero. So that's where um, if any value of S that would be bigger than two would, would work. So yes, definitely want to be sure um, calculating these limits at infinity Laplace transform is um, an improper integral. So that means you're going to have to calculate limits um, and you should be prepared to just justify your work um, when needed. Um, I would say again, for something like this one up here, I don't think there's much to say besides, besides that. Um, for this one over here, it definitely is nice to kind of include this little analysis over here. Um, but you could justify it as, as you see fit. So um, yeah, there was a question about n. And n is the thing that's going towards infinity. So n is positive and approaching larger and larger and larger positive numbers. Um, yeah, so that's why we know that this part over here, n is positive. So that's why we want to make sure that this piece is also positive. OK, um, any, any other questions? And um, so then we did one of these together last time that was a little bit trickier, um, calculating the Laplace transform. And um, on the quiz, I think you had something. No, uh, did you? Did I ask you to calculate a Laplace transform? I can't even remember. No, I did not. OK, um, I think I asked you what is a, the Laplace transform. Um, and that's given over here. So um, the really important thing, again, to keep in mind is we're starting with typically we, a function, which is um, a function of time. And then when we take this Laplace transform, we're integrating that with respect to t. So t is our variable. And this s is denoting like an arbitrary constant. So in the end, we'll see after this step, um, the t's should go away. And what's left is a function of s. And that function is what we call the Laplace transform. Um, so when you're calculating these, um, kind of step one would be to write out the definition. So I'm taking the Laplace transform of the constant two. So we just plug whatever our function is over here. Let's kind of set it up. Um, Um, and so step two would be to integrate this. Um, and so when we do that, here's where we need to set up this limit because we've got an improper integral. Okay, and again, um, our variable here is t. That's the only thing we're going to treat like a, a variable. And so um, for this one, we could pull out the two and then integrate e to the minus s t. And we still have this limit. Uh, and so you can kind of verify that that's what we would get at the integration stage. Um, and here to go from this step to this step, we're doing uh, integration by substitution. 
technically um, where u is equal to minus st. And again, the important thing to realize is these limits of our integral, since we're integrating with respect to t, are referring to t values. So um, after this integration step, um, what we've got is the limit for the upper limit as n goes to infinity of minus 2 over s e to the minus st. And then we would subtract what we get when we substitute t equals 0 in, um, in other words, getting the lower limit. And that would just give me um, minus 2 over s. Um, if I plug in 0 for t, this part right becomes 1. And what's left over is this. So you should expect to have some s's floating around here. And at um, the stage after we take the limit, we shouldn't have any t's left over. So you just might want to keep track of that when you're going through this work. <coughs> OK, any, any questions? OK, and then it's um, evaluate the limit. And so for this one, we could use L'Hopital's rule. So let me just kind of just add this um, below. So this is uh, this limit hold up. that we'd like to um, calculate. Ooh, I messed up someplace, right? Then we see where I, I ah. then we see where I messed up in here. You replaced, uh, you dropped the n, right? Yeah, that's right. I should have had an n over here um, because what we're doing is we're plugging in um, these values into t in our expression. So that looked weird to me when I was setting that up. I'm taking a limit and I didn't even have an n in that expression. So let me just say at this stage, you should have um, no t's left over. You've got an S, that's, you're going to treat as a constant for now. And then you've got N, which is the lip heading towards infinity. So N is varying here. And so now, um, just like we did with the integral, it never hurts to just kind of look at what's going on here and recognize what thing is varying and what things are constant. And so since this piece over here is independent of n, it's a constant. So we can pull that out. Um, and then what we've got left over is the limit as e uh, of e to the minus sn as n goes to infinity. And um, this limit over here is 
is equal to zero. As long as what is true about S? S is not zero. So S can't be zero. Um, that's right, because we're dividing by zero over here. Um, but there, what else needs to be true about S in order for this limit to actually be zero? It needs to be positive. Yeah, that was the reading quiz, right? So that S needs to be positive or else this limit wouldn't exist. So I, I should say that like technically this limit would exist if S was equal to zero because this would just be one. Um, but we don't want to include zero here because exactly we're dividing by S over here. And so let me just say, there's a really important part here, which is namely, whoops, this stuff over here. So the limit will converge only for certain values of S. And so the values for which this converges that tells me the domain of the Laplace transform. So that this analysis here is really important since the Laplace transform again is, is only going to be defined for certain values of S. So any, any questions about that? And um, nobody likes limits, I think. That's usually people's like least one of their least favorite parts about calculus. However, there is no calculus without limits. Um, so that's really, really important. And um, it is important for you to show this work over here because we need to know what the domain is. Um, so if you're asked to calculate a Laplace transform, just be aware that you would be expected to kind of show that work and come up with a justification for where the domain comes from. And so when you calculate that limit, it's going to be important to pay attention to the domain. So in this case, what we saw is that limit went to zero. And so all that's left over is this stuff over here. So, and so what's left over is this um, f of s. So um, just to use this language over here, we would say f of t equals 2 and f of um, s equal 2 over s for s greater than 0 are all uh, an example of what would be a Laplace pair. All right, any, any questions? How does this help us? And how did he find this Laplace? 
Um, what, what do you mean, how, how does it help us? Like, this is some cool fancy math and I like it, but uh, like, where, what, I guess you'll answer this soon, so never mind. But I'm curious about uh, this stuff. Yeah, so um, last time when I kind of introduced this, I, I was um, trying, was saying that these are going to be useful when we're trying to solve second order differential equations um, where the con where the terms in front of the y double prime y prime y um, might not necessarily be constant. Um, so what we're going to do to um, with Laplace transforms is we have some equation over here and since we initially have an equation if we do the same operation to both sides we're they're still going to be equal to each other. So um, if you think about it, like some differential equations, we solve just by integrating both sides. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is take the Laplace transform of both sides. So do a more complicated integral of both sides, and then we'll see what's going to be left over is going to be some algebraic equation to solve. So um, where we're heading with this is solving differential equations. That's the name of the game here. Um, we just need to develop some theory with Laplace transforms before we can get there. Okay, I like that. Yeah, so hold, hold on there. Um, we still have a couple of weeks to look forward to this semester. Um, and as with, um, you know, integrals, Let me just say, um, we'll have a little table over here and I don't wanna ruin the surprise of it just yet, um, but we kind of just proved what, how we can calculate the Laplace transform of um, a constant function. And so that two that we had, um, we'd calculated the Laplace transform of two. Um, you could go through this argument um, with any constant and it would, follow pretty similarly. Um, so I'll just say, as we're going through these, you want to be able to derive these when asked. Um, when not asked, you can just say, as we know in the table, the Laplace transform of this function is equal to some other function. Okay. Um, any, any questions? So I'd like you to have a chance to do one of these, um, with some help. Uh, so this is a good one to, to think about over here. Um, and so the idea, um, just make sure we have the right integral set up when we're going to do this work. So I want to calculate um, the Laplace transform of e to the 3t. So that's going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times e to the 3t dt. And again, t is our variable, s we're going to treat like a constant at this stage as well as 3. So um, my suggestion to you would be um, when we're going to try and integrate this, might be to um, kind of group these two exponentials together. And then maybe it's a little bit more clear how to integrate this using substitution, for example. Um, and so again, from this stage, to this stage, we're just using properties of exponents that say, um, this is the same thing as e to the minus st plus 3t, and then we can pull out a minus t. Okay, so any, any questions? about how to try and proceed here. So um, in your groups, um, I'll kind of float through, but um, it's great when I pop into a breakout room and I don't see black screens and muted buttons, but um, there's some 
discussion going on. So pay attention to how you're integrating this and then pay attention to how you're evaluating the limit and pay attention to what the domain is. Those are some key things um, to think about. Uh, okay, so good, checking in with the groups. I, I think everyone, um, all the groups came up with the uh, right answers, that's great. Um, so here's kind of the, the first part of the process after we set up the integral, evaluating it, you should have got something like this after um, doing U substitution um, uh, in this stage. And then when you're calculating these limits, this was like reading quiz question number two, right? Is okay, what is the, um, for what values of S is this thing gonna converge? And we would just wanna make sure in this case, um, this is gonna to go to zero as long as S is bigger than three. And we, we don't include three because we would have our problem with the zero in the denominator. So we exclude the three, but any value of S bigger than three is gonna give us um, that limit heading to zero. So then what's left over is Um, just the one over s minus three for s bigger than three. Uh, okay, any any questions about that? So let me kind of come back to our um, last page over here. So this gives us um, uh, second shortcut. So now we know how to calculate the Laplace transform of any exponential. Um, and again, there was nothing special about the three in um, that process. It would work very similarly for any constant a. Um, but here we do have a domain that we need to pay attention to. Um, for the trig functions, and um, there's a reason why we're paying attention to exponentials and trig functions in particular. Is we've seen these things come up when we're doing second order um, differential equations. So we're gonna wanna think about how we can take the inverse, or excuse me, how to take the Laplace transform of, of these. Um, so for the cosine, if we just leave the B general in here, um, I don't wanna go through this whole process, um, but I do wanna just kind of indicate how you could do it. Um, so for this one, you actually have um, two iterations of the uh, integration by parts. And um, after you do the second integration by parts, um, I'll just say, I'll, I'll put up the solutions, but um, the method that you'd want to use here is what's called the boomerang uh, method. Um, so I'll just say like, after you apply integration by parts two times, you're gonna wind up with something that's very similar to what you started with. Um, and then you can kind of move some terms around. But um, the process here would be, uh, we integrate this. And after the integration stage, um, you're left with the following limit and um, when we're evaluating this limit, what's gonna happen is, um, right, the cosine and the sine functions, they just bounce back and forth between one and minus one as um, n goes to infinity. So the fact that the exponential piece is heading to zero is what's gonna determine um, that whole limit going to zero uh, this limit is also going to go to zero as long as we have um, S is bigger than zero. So what's left over after all of that is um, just going to be an S. Since we still have um, this piece over here. We get an S over a B squared plus an S squared as long as S is bigger than zero. 
Um, so that's not something I would ask you to derive on an exam because um, that takes quite a bit of time, but I think it's nice to see where, where that shortcut formula is gonna come from. Um, so to come back to our table, oh, I skipped that one. Um, here's some of the others that um, we can take for granted here. So um, here's the cosine kind of outlines how that kind of goes. The sine would go very similarly and we get very similar things over here. Um, with the cosine, we have this variable S on top. When we take the Laplace transform of the sine, we get a constant B up here that depends on the constant B that was in here. So um, let me just say, you are welcome to use all of these shortcuts without justifying anything, unless the problem asks you to derive it from the definition of the Laplace transform. Um, and just kind of one last case that you might um, come across on homework, so this homework won't be due until after um, the exam, is if you have a, a piecewise defined function like this, then we don't change the definition It's just that this function is defined differently for different values of t. So we would split this up into um, from zero to two. Right, my value would be five that I plug in there. And then I'm gonna add to that when I integrate from two to infinity of e to the minus st, um, in this case, e to the eight t. DT. And so one of these pieces is just regular integral. There's going to be no limit. You'll just get something that depends on S on the end. Um, and this one, um, you have an improper integral. So for that piece, you are gonna have some limit that you would need to account for. Okay, any questions? Um, for Monday, um, we are gonna review for the exam. Um, it's gonna help after the exam if we have thought about this a little bit um, so I, I'm going to ask, uh, you are going to have a reading quiz for Monday. It's not going to be on new stuff. It's just going to be, um, hey, did you pay attention today? Um, did you look over the notes? Um, it basically is going to be, here's a function. Tell me what the Laplace transform is. And you're welcome to use the table to do those, obviously. OK, um, good. So that's a wrap for this worksheet. Um, and I want to start to now move towards um, how, what are some properties of the Laplace transform that we can take advantage of to help us do some of these calculations, streamline some of these calculations. Um, and again, where we're heading with this is we have some differential equation that we're ultimately going to try and solve. And so um, maybe that differential equation is um, for lack of just coming up with something off the top of my head. You know, we have some differential equation that we want to solve. So um, our process is going to say, well, let's take the Laplace transform of that side and let's take the Laplace transform of that side and then um, try and solve the resulting equation. 
Uh, and so this property of breaking up the Laplace transform over sums is going to be really important for us. Uh, and these properties really just follow from properties of integrals, right? Laplace transform is an integral. We can break up sums inside of integrals, so it's not too surprising that um, a similar property holds for Laplace transform. But um, to verify this, we can do a little proof here. So um, all I'm doing is plugging in F1 plus F2 into the definition of the Laplace transform. And um, seeing what we're hoping to get to in the end, though I don't want to assume this is true at this point, what seems like a reasonable thing to do next? Just split it up into a sum. Yeah, so we, we could distribute this to each of these and then we have a sum of two pieces that we could break up. So I can't break up this product, but we can break up sums. And so if I wanna kind of go through all of the steps carefully here, right, we can distribute the e to the minus st towards both terms. And then we can use this property of integrals that um, this breaks up. And um, this piece is exactly the Laplace transform of F1. This piece is exactly the Laplace transform of F2. So um, now we've got this property that we can break up um, sums. Any, any questions? Um, okay. And then um, this second property that's going to be nice is that we can pull out constants um, from inside the Laplace transform. Okay, so um, this is, again, is just going to follow from properties of integrals that, that we know. Um, so, but if we want to prove this a little more carefully, um, then uh, we write out the definition. And then we can just pull out the constant C. And um, this integral is exactly the Laplace transform of F. Okay, um, any, any questions? So um, just to kind of see how these properties might be used in practice. Okay, if I wanted to calculate this Laplace transform, and all the problem says is evaluate this, um, then you're allowed to use that table of shortcuts. So you don't actually need to plug this in and calculate this horrible looking integral. Instead, um, the work that you should show um, for something like this would be to show how we're using these properties. That would be good to see.
I can even be uh, very careful about this. So there we, I just broke up the sums and differences and, and pulled out the um, constants. And now we could refer to the table Right, that one we just did, um, provided S was bigger than zero. That one we did as well. We showed that we're gonna get five, we did two, right? We got two over S here, we would get five over S, provided that S was bigger than zero. And then this last one we just did as well, which gave us one over S minus six, provided S was bigger than six. So altogether, this Laplace transform, we would get, um, in this case, like six, if I simplify this, And what's important here is we have all of these different domains. So we want to make sure that this is defined, that the Laplace transform is defined for all of those pieces. So we, we take the intersection of all of those domains, which in this case would be S bigger than six. So um, the ones that we did to start today, those were that would be a question like using the definition of the Laplace transform, derive the formula for this. Um, otherwise, if you're just asked, find the Laplace transform of this, then the idea is to use some properties and the shortcuts um, on the table and not actually, we didn't integrate anything here. You shouldn't have to integrate anything in that case. All right. Any, any questions? And um, these are two properties um, that though that, you know, this is not a proof writing class, you certainly can um, justify these things. So that's something to just be sure that you're keeping mindful of. If you were asked to prove this thing or justify this thing, um, could you do it using the definition? Okay, so I think, um, yeah, this would be a, a good place to stop over here. So let's take a look at um, these, uh, one more property and see how we can apply that property um, to this example. And then um, we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, so here's a property that says, um, okay, what happens if we take the Laplace transform of a, some exponential function times f of t? And so um, here, you know, a, a good first step is always write out the definition. So again, um, just plugging in um, my function into the definition for the Laplace transform.
And so again, just kind of using properties of exponents, we could rewrite it like this. And um, so here we are. Here's the goal. We're trying to show this. Um, any thoughts on um, what we might do here? How could I integrate some product like this? What are some um, integration methods that tend to work or sometimes work with products? Still have integration by parts. Yeah, great. Um, yes, I was slow opening up the chat. So yes, thanks for all those. Yes, we would want to use integration by parts here. And um, so what we could do is, well, let's let um, u equal um, I think we want to try and do this piece over here. Um, Ah, no, let me, let me flip that around. Um, I am going to choose for my U, um, this piece over here. And I can choose um, that stuff as my, my B prime. Let's do this even easier. Sorry, I'm thinking off the top of my head here. I am going to try what other method of integration works sometimes when we have products. U sub, great. <laughs> Let's try that instead. Um, so I'm going to do a U substitution here. Sorry about that. And I'm going to let U equal this power. And this works um, very similar, right, to the um, example that you worked on together in your groups. It's a very similar um, U substitution. And so when I do this hey, substitution hey, and rewrite this in terms of U, Adam? yeah. Um, I have a question on why the, uh... It's S minus A? Yeah, so um, when you multiply these together, you would get um, E to the minus ST plus AT. And so if you factor out a minus T from each of those terms, you, you get that. Ah, OK, got yeah, it. Yeah, so pulling the minus T out makes that plus AT now um, the minus. Cool, thank you. Yep. OK. And um, so now we're going to integrate this, um, or at least set this up in terms of u. So I've got e to the u, um, and I'm going to have All right, let's make this even easier. Sorry. Plan two. Let's just try that. Um, so this is not going to even be a U substitution. I'm just going to introduce um, a new variable here. Sorry. And what's going to be nicer about um, this is let me Just replace the S minus A over here um, with a U. So 
So I've got uh, minus T times U um, all times F of T dt. Okay, sorry for the detour there. So um, let me just stop and say, all I'm doing here is I'm just introducing uh, a new variable u, which is just um, s minus a. And so when I do that, my integral looks like um, this step over here, and we're integrating with respect to t. And I want to just keep in mind over here, my, my limits for t um, haven't changed at all. And notice this is exactly the definition of the Laplace transform just um, instead of an S over here, this looks exactly the same, right? We just have a U over there. And so then let's just, ultimately, we would like to write this back in terms of um, our original variable, which was S. So now doing a substitution gives us S of minus A. And um, let me just say, where, where does this domain come from? Well, we said that this Laplace transform is gonna exist as long as S is bigger than alpha. So in this case, this is gonna exist as long as U is bigger than alpha, since we know that this one exists for S bigger than alpha. So we also would want to just rewrite that as S minus A bigger than alpha, which is where this domain comes from. That's what we wanted to show. So what, what the big result here is, what effect does this multiplication by an exponential have it just is going to shift the original Laplace transform horizontally to the right by a units. Um, and so let me just say, in addition to like this table of Laplace transform shortcuts that you have, um, right, it might also be helpful to keep a running tally of properties. So um, when you're trying to use this property, say, to answer question two, um, you're welcome to say, we're going to use this property to evaluate this Laplace transform, and you don't have to verify that the property works. So um, here we've proven, well, let me just take a break before I um, apply this. Are any any questions about number one? Yeah, is it always a shift to the right? It is always going to be a shift to the right um, okay. by A. If A happens to be negative, then it actually would get shifted to the left. Okay. Um, but yeah, so if we are assuming that A is positive, um, then this would be a shift to the right by A units. What exactly is that function f? Uh, it's any function. Any, any function? Yeah, any function provided that we know the Laplace transform of. 
So all we're saying is um, if we know the Laplace transform of F is defined, then we can calculate this. So that's what's going on down here. So if I know what this is, then I'm going to be able to calculate that. Okay. So in this case, my, my F would be cosine of B of T. Um, but generally speaking, it's going to be a function that we've already talked about how to find the Laplace transform. Where does the, the alpha come from? Is it just in the problem statement and we work around it or is there- It, it comes else? from um, the fact that we're gonna start with something that we know how to calculate the Laplace transform of. And so with any Laplace transform, we should state the domain. Um, so why don't we just, let, let's do an example and then I think it will illustrate um, some of these questions. Um, so if I, um, I'm trying to work on question two, and um, we can now use the fact that we know this. Um, yeah, so this was S over S squared plus B squared provided S is bigger than zero. So um, this information over here is like equivalent to what we start with over there up top. So we have some function, we know what its Laplace transform is and we know what the domain of that Laplace transform is. So over here, we've got our function f of s is exactly this s over s squared plus b squared. And so now we could just use this property that says, if we multiply by a to the et, it's going to shift this known Laplace transform to the right by a units. So all I'm going to do is replace every s with this, with s minus a. And we also shift the domain, which is in, which was an initially s is bigger than zero to now be s is bigger than zero plus a, which is just s bigger than a. Um, so that would be the work required for something like that. Okay, so uh, I'll stop here. We've got a little bit more work to go, um, but um, I, I can add some entries to this table knowing this property over here. So we'll kind of pick up from this point next time. Um, but now we can add these things to um, our table. And over here, I'm just keeping a tally of some of the properties that we've done. We've done the first three so far. And what we really need to do is think about how we take the Laplace transform of derivatives. So that's gonna be kind of the last stage and then we can start to look at differential equations. Um, and so when you're working on your problems, you can refer to these things as using property L1, using property L2 or whatever. Um, but I would like to see that justification about what property you're using um, when you're evaluating some of these problems. Uh, okay, so um, thanks everyone. Just want to let you know again, there are some review problems up for the exam next week. So you can start taking a look at those. There is no homework due next week. Um, you'll have a reading quiz on Monday that's going to be on a review of what we talked about. Um, so really um, just using um, the first several entries of this table over here. Um, and being able to calculate Laplace transforms from the table 
and at most um, using the first three properties on, on the table, or the first three properties over here. Um, and then in class on Monday, we're, we're gonna take a look at material that's on the exam, review for the exam, um, and then we'll pick up after the exam with this stuff again. Um, okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, have a nice afternoon. And if you've got some advising questions, feel free to come by um, that session later on today.